Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Mantrack Live. My name is Tristan Kuzlin, I'm the Senior Marketing Manager at the Mantrack Group. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Today is our third Mantrack Live event actually. Uh, if you've managed to miss any of our previous episodes, you can get us on YouTube at the Mantrack Group YouTube channel. Uh, we're also on whatever Facebook uh, your local Mantrack dealer has there. So. What I'd like to say is we've been taking your feedback and uh, listening to what our uh, customers have been telling us and they're saying we'd like to see more about Caterpillar maintenance. So we thought why not dedicate a session here today and, and often it's quite a, a fantastic treat to have one uh, worldwide expert attend today and actually we've got two. So we've got two uh, worldwide experts, uh, Alex from outside of uh, uh, the US for Exxon, and we have John also coming from the US uh, for some creation products as well. So they'll be joining us, talking us through some of the science behind uh, our products and services. Second to that, we have also will be crossing live to Kamasi in Ghana to see our fluid analysis uh, our facility there. So we will be talking about CAD SOS, fluid analysis, and going through some of the technology or best practice in being able to manage and, uh, and handle our preventative maintenance. But before we jump into all of that, just a couple of administration points uh, to touch on. So first off, uh, the session is recorded, so we will be recording this. If you do wish to watch it later, we will send you an email uh, of the recording. Uh, you can also uh, see it uh, on the Mantrack Group YouTube channel uh, a little bit later on as well. We'll upload it. Uh, now your devices will be on mute so we won't be able to hear you, but that's a very important piece when we start talking about how WebEx works. So we most certainly want to take your questions and be able to answer them. We have two experts here. We'll be crossing to our expert uh, in Ghana as well that will be able to uh, facilitate uh, your answers. So please use the Q&A buttons on the right hand side there and send your questions through. We'll tabulate them. Uh, we'll be able to answer some of them as we go, but we'll leave them to the very end so that we have a proper Q&A session right at the end. There is also a chat button there. We'll share some helpful links that you may want to do uh, some further investigation later on. You can also chat to us if you have anything that you, that's on your mind. Um, and finally and most importantly is your feedback. So we most certainly take this into account when we create our next Mantrack Live events. Anything that you'd like to see, please fill it in uh, in your feedback survey at the very end. Now there's two surveys that pops up. One is for WebEx, the other is for Mantrack. So you'll see that Mantrack uh, one just there. Please fill that in. We'd love to hear uh, your comments and be able to tailor as we go along. Now finally, a note on safety. So in the new normal, you may be working from home, you may be working in an office at the moment. We are streaming live uh, across four different territories at, or uh, continents at the moment. So who knows where we are in the world. Uh, but please just note that uh, if you are in the office, take some time now with your team to just kind of sit there, talk about where your fire exits are, the emergency numbers and safety procedures of your facility. If you are working from home, there are new considerations. Please ensure that your back posture is correct. You have the appropriate seating to height uh, ratio for your laptop. Uh, and of course, if you have any small children like myself, uh, please make sure that they're in a safe area away from uh, any kind of electrical cables or hot drips. Now, when it comes to uh, the all-important coronavirus, please follow your local government recommendations, uh, not only for the health of yourself and your family, but also your community. So in saying that, let's get right into the uh, presentation. And yes, most certainly we have a lot of expertise on the table. Uh, I was just busy making some calculations here and we've actually got uh, over 100 years uh, Caterpillar and ExxonMobil experience at the table today, um, which kind of is showing uh, everybody's age a little bit. Uh, but we most certainly have Xavier coming uh, from Kumasi. Xavier is our oil lab expert. He'll be guiding us through the importance of taking a sample, uh, what we do, the technology we deploy when we're doing oil fluids and fluid analysis, and then also looking at reports, how we take those insights and turn them into recommendations. 
Second to that, we've got Alex and Michael uh, coming from Exxon Mobil. Alex is that global product expert with over 20 years experience in Exxon. Michael also over 20 years, he's our strategic global accounts uh, in the key regions of, of the African markets. And of course, we have John McConnell coming, uh, coming live from the US. John is a global market professional for preventative maintenance products specifically. He's been in the filter game for well over 20 years now. You know, pretty much end-to-end -end everything we need to know. So if you have any questions for any of our panelists today, please start filling it in on your question bar just on the right-hand side. So jam-packed agenda most certainly. Uh, we'll be crossing live to Kamasi very shortly to begin our, uh, our journey through uh, oil sampling. But we most certainly will be talking about who Mantrak is, just very briefly for those that may not be aware of us as a Caterpillar dealer across Africa. Uh, we'll also be talking straight into the science behind our yellow blood, our cat oil, and what really differentiates us to our competition. We'll go then cross live into the uh, SOS lab where we'll see some of the technology we deploy. Uh, we'll move over to John to talk filters, both air and fluid. Uh, we'll move back toward Kamasi to talk about reporting and how we utilize uh, in, uh, fluid analysis insights to make preventative measures uh, to save all of us uh, on the bottom line. And of course, we'll close off with those questions and answers. So jumping into it, for those that may not be familiar with Mantrac, uh, we are a Caterpillar dealer uh, across 10 territories within Africa. Uh, we have a substantial distribution footprint supporting our customers. And this is most certainly important, particularly in the Africa regions, as we continue to see sectors increase uh, heading into 2021 and beyond. Companies will need to partner with someone that can support them with their scalable growth. And Mantrak is most certainly uh, proven to be unequal when it comes to our distribution footprint, our service capability, uh, and the amount of investment we do within our within our regions. So, with over 120 million dollars uh, in parts inventory, we are big on keeping parts on the shelves for our customers. We have over 866 technicians that are all CAT certified, trained, all experts in their field. We have a branch footprint which is sizable within. West, East, and North Africa. And of course, we have vast, uh, or I should say, we have substantial capability and technology deployed whenever we start talking about things like component rebuild centers, where we really delve into those big machines, uh, as well as our fluid analysis, our condition monitoring expertise as well. So a bit about that, but what we really want to drive into uh, today is that total cost of ownership. So not looking at just initial pricing, but how do we really generate uh, a reduction in overall owning and operating costs uh, for our fleet out there today? And the one thing that we often say and point to is repairing after failure can be at least 50% more expensive than just doing appropriate preventative maintenance. When we talk about preventative maintenance, we're really talking about that planned maintenance scheduling, plus the technology that allows us to be uh, a little bit more ahead of the game, things like equipment management. And when we start thinking about these kind of things and we see a dollar value next to it, uh, you know, we often say these things of what would you rather? And you know, we all know that Caterpillar parts can last 50% longer uh, when, we do, when we use it in conjunction with cat filters or fluids. But then we start thinking, okay, so would you rather replace a hydraulic pump at six or nine years? And when we start doing the cost per, per year, you start seeing these benefits come through. For our fleet owners, you know, what's the question that we would like to ask you? Uh, you know, would you like to have your machine to last for 10 years without any significant major repairs or 15? And when you start looking at that and multiplying that out across your fleet, that's where you start generating significant reductions in your costs. Uh, and then of course, when it comes to fuel injectors, when we say a 45% increase by just taking care of your, fill, uh, your injectors, you know, what does that actually mean for our business or our customers out there? Well, it actually means changing out once rather than twice uh, within the lifespan of a particular fleet. And when you start thinking of the way in which Caterpillar equipment is built, it's all built to be rebuilt. So everything works as a, as a system. So you know, whether you need to 
increased life or what have you, if you do it in conjunction with the appropriate guidance of the OMM, you can increase the life of that entire system, but then avoid these costly changeouts that may or may that may occur uh, when you're going through uh, your life cycle. And of course, one thing that Alex and Michael will really touch on is um, you know, utilizing cat fluids to be able to increase life. And most certainly time and time again, we've seen when you utilize cat fluids in conjunction with the appropriate maintenance and fluid analysis, you can double the lifespan of engine life. But of course, where do we start? There is so much when it comes to equipment management and also how we actually deploy uh, the appropriate servicing intervals for our units. And really, we could have touched on all of this, but we'd be here for days. So we thought, what better to start on the science behind it? Let's look at some of our products first, and then we can delve into some of the other things. So today, we'll really focus on uh, cat fluids. We'll talk about cat filtration, and we'll talk about the importance of cat SOS. So in saying that, we'll need to cross over to Ghana and hopefully, Savia, you can hear me. How, how are you doing, Savia? How's, uh, how's the lovely Ghana, Kumasi? Ghana is good, shining as usual. It is. And it everything is. is going well. I can tell you over in London, there's nothing shining at the moment. <laughs> it's ah. all fog, nothing but fog. So uh, <laughs> you, you, get the, you get the sunshine. Uh, and you get the absolute pleasure of showing us today how best to take a sample. So, Xavier, Xavier is our SOS uh, champion out in the region. He'll be able to guide us through and kick off our journey. So, Xavier, when you're ready, over to you. Thank you, Tristan. Hello, viewers. Welcome to Kumasi, Ghana, SOS Lab. I am Xavier Kawada, supervisor. Today, I'm here to take you through the Caterpillar recommended methods for taking SOS samples. There are two methods for taking SOS samples. And these are through the vacuum pump method, where you have the vacuum pump. As part of the tools, you have a cutter for cutting the tube, for taking the sample. Then always keep your tube in a very dust-free package. Then you have your tube for taking the sample. And of course, the SOS bottle that will be containing the sample. The next one is by taking sample to the sample valve probe. Where well, we have the valve probe, which is here, you always have a pack packaged nicely by Caterpillar, as I'll show you very soon. In this particular package, you have the probe and the bottle, and then the sampling cap screw. We'll be demonstrating all that. And then you have the, the probe holder. This is supposed to prevent you from getting bent when you are taking sample. The valve probe is for taking sample in uh, pressurized systems such as engine hydraulic and then transmissions. Wherever there is pressure and there are valves, you can use this one to take the sample, the valve probe to take the sample. And whenever, wherever you don't have pressurized system, the best way of taking the sample is using, or the recommended way of taking the sample is using the sample vacuum pump and the tube. With that, I'll take you right. I also want to indicate that some normally try to drain the oil, pass is draining, and they try to fetch it along the line. That is not recommended, it will not give you the right result. So as I go and start the process, please take a critical look at what I'm doing, and it will help you. Thank you. First of all, you need to make sure your equipment is washed, if possible. But if you're in the field and it can't be washed, you make sure you clean the surrounding to make sure there's no contamination to be introduced. We always want to make sure that samples we receive are coming from the compartment, but not from the surrounding, so that our report can easily recommend the right action to take with confidence, and it will yield result to you, the equipment owner. So first you clean your surrounding. Make sure you clean the system. Then you untuck. But as this is done, you make sure you wiggle a little bit to make sure any pressure over there will not cause a splash of the oil into your face. 
Then with your tube and tube cutter and your pump, you measure your tube to be sure to take the sample at the middle of the level. This idea is that at the bottom, the sediment is high. At the top, the sediment is very light. By midway, you get the accurate volume. Then if I get a volume, I take the length, I add additional from the tube to the bottom. This is a recommended cutter for cutting the SOS tube, the sampling tube. You just cut once and knit. So I'm now going to fix it. To be just two and a half centimeters from the edge of the tube here. So I tighten it. And I adjust the tube a little. I must indicate that some normally use a knife to try to cut the tube. But if you do that, the scratches as it moves forth and back, pushes some of the dirt on the knife into the tube, which becomes part of the analysis we do, which is deceptive. We always want to make sure the right thing is done. So we now go and take the sample using the vacuum pump. With this open already, make sure you place it where it will not be contaminated, the plug will not be contaminated. So I put it neatly there and I introduce my tube. Please make sure the pump is oriental to the fill line. This is supposed not to get it tilted because if it's tilted and we start fetching, the pump the oil will contaminate the pump and my contaminate uh, other samples. So I tighten it to make sure my pressure is exerted. Then I start. There is a fill line on the bottle. So as you get closer to it, you reduce the pressure. And that will cut the flow of the fluid or the oil or the sample you are taking. So I reduce the pressure. Then I remove this. I cover this as quickly as possible. The idea is not to get what is left over in the compartment contaminated. The best is to cut here, to drop the side that is flowing. And instead of removing it out, we will contaminate it with the other end that has some of the fluid attached to it. So you lose it, and then You drop it through the other end. With this, our sample has been taken. I quickly cover it with a cast screw. And our sample from the vacuum pump method is settled. The next is to take the sample using the valve probe. For this, we open the cap, the dust cap of the valve. This is the valve probe. We open the dust cap, wipe it neatly with a lint free da uh, rag. If you don't have a good one, you can order it from Caterpillar, check from your dealership, they'll give you a recommendation for the part number. Then, the initial thing we do is to take a waste sample. It's supposed to clean the sample valve over here. So, I'm going to connect this. And I'll cover it with a sampling cap screw. This gives an opportunity for air pressure to move out when the sample is going in so that you don't mount unnecessary pressure in the system. Under the normal circumstance, because the pressure system, the engine should have been on as I take the sample. But because we wanted the sound to be clear, today we will not be taking the sample. We will not be turning the engine on, but just observe critically what I do. So this is the waste bottle for clean for taking for cleaning the system. So first I put it back. 
and if the engine were on, you would have seen it flowing into the sample bottle. I felt just a little close to half, just to clean the valve. Then this is wet oil, so I no longer need it. So I would have discarded this. Then now, this is the full set. It's a package from Caterpillar for taking sample from sample valve. It has all the set in it. In order not to contaminate the, the set, we most of the times mount it inside the bag, especially if you are in the field. So I add the, the probe holder. And then the sampling cap screw. So I remove this. I keep it inside the poly bag so that the environment does not contaminate it. Then I mount, quickly mount this, the valve onto the cap. This is actually the sample that we need for analysis. The first one was just to clean the valve. So I go with the engine on, and on low idle, maybe they step on it a little bit, then the fluid will flow into the bottle until you reach the fill line. After that is done, you remove it, close the dust cap as quickly as possible, not to introduce contamination, then you remove these two. You no longer need, but you need a probe holder. Then you cover it. Quickly, you label the cup. So this would have been hydraulic. So I would have labeled this and put it down. While this would be rear final drive right. If you don't label the cap screw and cap it quickly, you will contaminate the sample. And if you don't do so too, you might be taking a lot of samples and you mix them up, you can identify which is which. If it should happen that you are using equipment which is not Caterpillar equipment, because we work on, we analyze sample from non-cut equipment as well. And then you are using the, you are using the, this stick. Please make sure you take the, you measure it to the level of the disc stick. Then you mark the tube with a direction showing that this is the side that will be going into the tube. Then you leave an allowance for where to hold. Then you cut with a cutter. Please don't use the knife. With this, you have comfortably done all the analysis, uh, the sample rightly for the right analysis. Then you fill the information that is supposed to be stuck onto the bottle with the submission form, and please don't delay the samples, because when you leave them, the chemistry of the sample goes down, or you might not get the right result. Thank you very much, viewers. Thank you very much, viewers. Thank you very much, Xavier, for that in-depth uh, demo on how exactly we should take a sample. Now, taking the right sample to ensure no contamination is extremely important so that we can get the right recommendations quickly and swiftly back to our customers. So thank you very much for that. So we'll catch up and go back to Saviour in a, in a very short while uh, where he'll take us through uh, the SOS lab and show us some of the technology we deploy uh, in order to be able to analyse uh, fluids for our customers. Now, of course, there's some three critical tests to support your equipment. Now, depending on which territory uh, you are within the Mantrak region, we offer a range. Some of this we, we do, some is coming. For example, I know coolant sampling will soon be available in Ghana, uh, whereas it is available in other, in other territories. So all sampling, coolant sampling, and of course, importantly, diesel fuel sampling, ensuring that you have quality diesel going into your units, which is very important in the Africa region. But really, whenever we're looking at fluid sampling uh, as a whole, we're always looking at you know, four key uh, tests, you know, in ensuring that you know, has the wear increased within the compartment? Uh, has the fluid deteriorated within the particular compartment? Uh, is it contaminated? And then finally, uh, shockingly, is it the actual right fluid to begin with? Uh, we're able to do all of these analyses in a very simple and quick way and give you the appropriate recommendations as a result of that. But, of course, I've been saying fluid, 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 and it does all start with the yellow blood. So uh, 
if we can now cross over to our two ExxonMobil uh, experts, Alex and Michael, um, we'd love to hear more from these guys and learn about, a bit more about the science and technology that goes into creating uh, what we see as a world-class product when it comes to cat oil. So Alex, Michael, are you there? Yes. Hi, Tristan. How are you? Uh, very well. Very well. Thank you for joining us again uh, for, for our latest episode. So, gentlemen, please take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Tristan. So, first, um, my name is Michael Fidel. I am uh, Africa. I'm the Caterpillar Account Manager uh, responsible on Africa from Exxon. Uh, I would like to thank you all for joining today's uh, Mantrak webinar. Let me start by giving you a brief about the ExxonMobil and Caterpillar partnership. Actually, the cat oil and grease program started 33 years ago, when Caterpillar found the need to control fluids as, as part of its equipment design. At that time, they agreed uh, with ExxonMobil to produce and distribute uh, uh, the, uh, the, cat, the Caterpillar uh, original product. But let's ask ourselves a very important question. What are so unique about the cat oil? And what are the main differentiators between cat oil and the other lubricant in the market? I would like to invite Mr. Alex uh, Tchaikovsky, uh, uh, our global uh, caterpillar advisor from ExxonMobil Research Engineering in the United States. Hey, Alex, how are you? Good morning, Michael. Good morning, good morning. Tristan, and good morning, Mantrak. Um, it's a great pleasure to, ha to be in and join you all here. My name is Alex Joukowsky, as Michael said. Uh, I've had the pleasure to work for ExxonMobil for 26 years, and over those 26 years, I've worked about 21 of them with Caterpillar in many different uh, areas of the business, and now looking at and managing the global technology for their uh, Caterpillar grease and oil program. I want to give you a little bit of background of ExxonMobil and how we're very similar to Caterpillar. Um, as you saw in Michael's first slide, there's a picture of a haul truck there. That's at our curl facility in Canada. We've got over 100 of those 777 haul trucks and, and very proud to, to work with those every day. So uh, ExxonMobil Corporation, there's, there's three pillars there. And again, we're a fully integrated oil and gas company. And again, that's scalable around the world. So this, uh, this helps the uh, product get, get to where it needs to get to in, in the right quantities, et cetera. So I talked about the upstream, talked a little bit of touch chemicals and fluids and lubricants. Those are our three pillars. But let's get to the where the yellow blood starts. And that all starts with the two companies underneath, and it's the ExxonMobil Upstream and Research Company, and then ExxonMobil Research and Engineering, who I work for. Just below that, you're going to see Corporate Strategic Research. And again, that's where we work with Caterpillar from literally the newest molecule or the fuel or whatever that might be that's just being developed now that might be some type of a technology in 5 to 10 to 20 years out, that's where that whole process begins is corporate strategic, strategic research, and I manage that part of the relationship as well. And it's very, it's very interesting to see technologies that have started out five or six years ago, and now they're just starting to make it into, into the uh, lubricant world today. So that's, that's where it all starts, the yellow blood right there. And then underneath it all is ExxonMobil Biomedical Sciences. And what that uh, part of our business does is making sure that whatever we do, whatever we develop, that we do it environmentally safe and responsible. Go to the next slide, Michael. All right. So the cat oil development process, again, this is much different than anybody else's. Uh, being that I've been around this for 20 years, I I've seen it. And how it all starts is you see that big box there says profile uh, performance. And, and what that is is where we work with Caterpillar. They have a, uh, PhDs and formulators as well. And we look at uh, with, work with their product group and their machine group. And we try to understand what the profile performance is. For example, you know, how much friction do we need in actual clutches and transmissions? And, and what is too much friction and, and et cetera? And, and understanding the temperatures underneath the piston crown, et cetera. So when we're developing this fluid, we know what the load, the speed, the temperatures, the environment, and then the metallurgy as well, and all the other components that touch that oil, or oil touches. 
So as we're developing it, this is a complete system that, that John McConnell is going to talk about later because the fluids, the filters, the oil analysis, all that comes together and it starts all right here in the profile performance. And in that performance what we're looking for is we look at the best and optimized base stock and additive selection. We want to make sure that whatever we work with, that's balanced and it works well. So we take those candidates, it could be up to 10 different candidates of oil, and we run them first past the industry test limits, and that's just the entry level to see how well it performed. And then if it passes all the industry test levels, we select a handful of them and we continue on with Caterpillar proprietary testing. Again, that's far, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about later, but we've seen products where it didn't quite, you know, meet the bill. And again, we failed them. Caterpillar failed them and said, no, we're going back to the drawing board. We're going to, re we're going to redo this product again. And uh, eventually, you know, we, we come to a, a great product, and that's a, a commercialized Caterpillar oil you'll see in your cat drum and pail and jugs as well. All right, so performance and ver testing verification. You know, we talked about the, the process here. Well, the laboratory testing, that's standard. Everybody does that, and you have to do that to, to enter, enter the game is what we would say. But then you look at rig testing. There's standard rig tests that oil companies and manufacturers send their oils to, and they test it, and then they send their results back. What's unique about Caterpillar is they have a, an enormous amount of cat proprietary testing that they do at all their facilities around the world. They have test facilities, they have testing, engineering testing facilities as well, um, and it's, it's very, very interesting when you, get to, when you get to work with that and see it come full motion. And then there's full-scale component testing, and then some, some of these other companies do that standard for them. There's some standard testing out there. We'll talk more about that as well, what the differences are. But then there's Caterpillar proprietary testing. Again, another whole level of endurance testing, and, the, and, that, and that's what really differentiates Caterpillar. And then we look at the final phase there, which is product development advantage is clearly field demonstration. There isn't any other OEM out there that does as much field demonstration and testing as Caterpillar does. Just to test one engine oil, we could, we could test 10 haul trucks around 10 different places in the world uh, for over 10,000 hours. Take the engine apart and then put it back together and inspect it. So there's a, it's a very, very rigorous process. So when we look at this rigorous process, you know, we, we like to try to always compare ourselves to, to what the industry is. And, and a, a typical industry category you're going to see is what's called API, American Petroleum Institute. And the API changes, and, and it changes based on emissions might be changed, fuel technologies might be introduced, and then other different types of uh, requirements increased in each oil classification. Sorry about that. My um, microphone got misplaced. Okay. So I'm back here. So again, as things change, when you look at API, Caterpillar has its own classification. It's called ECF2. And again, what does that mean? We know that Caterpillar equipment is tortured, tortures the oil much more than any other product can out there because we want it to last. We want that total cost of ownership to be incredible, an incredible experience. So ECF2 is designed to provide additional performance, and you'll see ECF3 as well. But ECF2 is designed to have better and higher levels of dispersant additives. What does that mean? When we're looking at CI4, CI4+, plus, et cetera, we want to make sure that we don't have any sludge form. And that's why we put heavy, high, higher levels of dispersant additives to neutralize those sludges from forming. We want to take it out with the oil. We look at the higher quality base stocks. Again, the reason why we do that, we're always refining them. We just did that again. We want to prevent oxidation. We want to prevent oil consumption and as well as soot thickening and wear. Those are all very detrimental to your engine. And then when we use a viscosity, a, a, a viscosity modifier, a very shear stable, what does that mean? Over the drain, we want the oil to slowly decrease, slowly um, dissipate the additives and use them. You don't want a drastic drop because, again, it's, it's tough to measure and it's not good for your equipment. So we want to make sure that whatever we do is very shear stable and provide a big balanced overall picture. As you can see in that picture, a, a lot of times there's some things that aren't as balanced, but Let's go beyond that. Let's go beyond the API categories because that's what we're that's what we're targeting toward. Again, Caterpillar tested beyond industry standards. 
When I look at Caterpillar Oils, there's no other company that submits their oils to what I would call this torture test application. Uh, it's very hard to formulate oils based on, on, on the testing, but that's why we do it, because we want to ensure that however we torture this oil, it doesn't matter the application, uh, this oil will withstand it and, and go far beyond any uh, standard application. So let's review the five additional tests here. Uh, Michael, if we could go move forward. So okay, so the first one is caterpillar ring sticking. It's an AT41, and that's the mapping of, of the of the endurance test and how the engine works. It's a 500-hour test. It's a steady state. It's at full load, and this is what we're trying to do is create the worst deposits, the worst condition for deposits. And when we create deposits, we want to increase control. We want to look at oil consumption control again, and also are the deposits sticking the rings. Are they creating issues around that area? And we also want to see the used oil condition, see what kind of metals are in there, and understand the metallurgy of it. Then we compare it to the other DEO experiences we've had in the past. Another test we do, this is one of five, is a, a truck cycle test. This is a 500-hour test, and also we run it up to 650 hours. And if we're looking at to do some additional research, we'll go beyond that, and we'll talk about the 650 hours here in a little bit. It's a cyclic test, and it's at 75% load, and this represents severe on-highway service. Again, most of our equipment plays in the mud. It's severe off-highway, and we're going to talk about that test here. But again, we also want to represent that, you know, that oil also goes in the on-highway sector as well. And we're also looking, again, at oil consumption control, deposits, ring sticking, and used oil condition. And here's the cat wheel loader cycle test. Again, this is a 650-hour test to a very high load factor. And this really, truly tries representing the off-highway service or the off-highway uh, market. It's typically what we try to do is run it at a lower a uh, horsepower, and what you're trying to do is uh, app, uh, to to simulate the similar engines like used in a wheel loader application, which is very severe. And again, when we look at the conditions, what we're trying to do is create soot. And and when we treat we create soot, we know we're going to create wear. And we also want to see how that wear where is it actually is it depositing also on the pistons and the rings. We want to see the oil consumption control. Are we starting to see a lot more uh, top off needed? That means the oil is getting past the rings and we're starting to get sticking. So that's what we're trying to do is really torture the oil in this test. And then here's another interesting test, and actually I'm on my way there today. Uh, so it's a, a Caterpillar 3500 series, so big, big engine. It's run at the Caterpillar Lafayette United States, Indiana United States production facility. I have the pleasure of being there today. We're working on a new, a new project, very exciting project on the natural gas engine oil side. But this is a short 85-hour engine quality audit test. Again, what they're trying to do is they're breaking the engine in. They want to see if there's any type of abnormally whatso abnormalities whatsoever. And if there are, they do a partial disassembly regardless, and they're looking for deposits and wear to see if there's anything unusual. Um, no other OEM takes engines apart like this after 85 hours to inspect them. So this is a great, great thing that the, the, the Caterpillar does, as well as the uh, Caterpillar rebuild centers like Mantrak has around the world. They, they do a fantastic job uh, at the rebuild facilities and uh, as well as assembling new. Again, another Caterpillar engine test is a 500-hour truck cycle test. We talked about this before. This is the on-highway, very severe. And again, what we're looking at are those deposits, consumption control, and used oil analysis. And if you look at the piston on the top, that's the Caterpillar piston. And then when you look at the bottom one is, is the competitor oil on, uh, with their piston, and, and it failed. And there were some deposits there, and you see some uh, abrasive, uh, abrasive deposits that formed, and uh, that would be a failing inspection. So there is differences when you look at how it reacts in the engine. We'll take a little closer look at that as well. There's Cat DEO on the left, and then there's the, the failing uh, competitive Canada on the right. As you can see where the highlight is, it looks pretty bad, and that, that deposit there will score a liner and create wear over time. Again, looking at the oil pan of those competitor, on the left, you'll see the CAT DEO, no varnish, no sludge. And again, those varnishes and sludges become, uh, 
the, the life robbing deposits that takes away from your owner and operator experience and your your total cost of ownership. We're on the, the 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 photo on the right is the competitive fluid. Again, what is it doing? It's dropping all those deposits out inside the engine, and we don't want that. We want the oil to take it out at the drain. Okay, so we talked about you know DEO test beyond industry requirements. Again, what we look at as industry requirements is just the just the the key to just open the door. But with Caterpillar, we have our own specifications, CAT DEO ECF2, and as you can see there, there's many more and much more in-depth testing. Again, we want to make sure that this oil is designed for our equipment, our system that's going to be pushed as hard as we can by our customers each and every day, and we know it's going to perform. Thank you so much, Alex, for your time. Well, uh, thank mean, you for having me. Thank you. So, uh, finally, I mean, um, for the total cost of ownership, I mean, if if we think about it, I mean, we will find that on average, uh, uh, globally, we have around the, the cost of fuel uh, filters and and uh, um, and lubricant is around three percent of the of du during the lifetime of that equipment. Out of that, one hundred. So we have still 27% for the repairs, 28 for the operators. So, I mean, if we are going to say that we will save something on the 3%, let's say uh, we will get on the, um, on the filters or the lubricant around 20 or 30 or 40% discount versus the original uh, product, then we are saying that we are getting 30 or 40% out of the 3%. However, we are affecting on the other 97% of our running cost due to it we might have um, higher drain intervals mechanical problems unusual uh, consumption of lubricant and fuels risk of guarantee downtime increase so all this could happen and that's why we always say that cat oil is an investment not a cost we also have many many uh, success stories from across the globe where we were able to document those success stories we have, for example, uh, uh, from Jordan, a customer who saved $15K by switching to cut genuine oil and filters. We have another customer who used like 20% of what he used to use from uh, the bases. We have another one who used around 157, who saved around $157K uh, uh, by switching to uh, original uh, 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 lubricant and uh, uh, filters. So many, many, many from across the world. You, of course, you will have a link uh, to download all this and read them all uh, through it. Thank you all uh, uh, for your time today. Uh, over to you, Tristan. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you both. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Michael, for joining us and really delving into some of that uh, science that goes behind uh, what is a world-class product when it comes to, to cat oil. And we'll jump the presentation back over to myself and we'll be able to continue on. Um, yeah, but really what we were highlighting there and really that important bit there of the things like ring sticking tests, truck cycle tests, uh, cat engine tests, uh, there is a lot more than uh, meets the eye when it comes to the type of testing that we're performing. And look, when it comes to um, you know, all this sort of stuff, um, you know, Caterpillar, Exxon, in collaboration, there's been so much work to go into this uh, to ensure that we meet that spec and really raise the bar when it comes to uh, performance. So what we'll do uh, in continuing on is we will transfer over to Saviour if Saviour is around. Let me stop sharing because we're going right back to the Ghana Kumasi facility. We're now in the oil lab with Saviour. Saviour will be running through some of the technology we deploy when it comes to uh, CAD SOS and really what sets us above the rest. Uh, so Saviour, when you're ready, highlight some of that gorgeous technology we've got there and show us some of the best practices that you've deployed uh, when it comes to quality management. Take it away, Saviour. Thank you, Tristan. US and all participants, I work you. I welcome you back to Kumasi SOS Lab, where we turn the fluid analysis into a report for you for your preventive maintenance interview to make precise decisions on your equipment health. SOS service is a proprietary process, process developed by Caterpillar over 40 years ago to turn fluid from equipment compartments into useful data for preventive maintenance practices. 
to run to cut down your cost and then manage your equipment successfully. In basic principle, SOS service is just closer to clinical laboratory service for human. But in this case, it's for heavy equipment. Where we check the fluid, either coolant or oil from your equipment compartment to give you the yielded report for you to make precise decision. Samples received in the lab normally comes in this particular package from various customers in each day. When samples are received, we sort them. We sort them first into their customers, and under each customer, we sort them into equipment, and under each equipment for same customer, we sort them under compartments, as you know for your equipments already. After all that is done, we, we divide them into badges of 30 to make it workable and to make your turnaround time move very fast. There are a few items that comes across. When you take a sample and you want to make a quick decision because your operator observes some anomaly on equipment that you urgently need to go work in, and you send a sample. You have special arrangement with our customers. The such samples, they highlight the cap screw, either with any color or a marker. Then the moment samples, such samples arrive in the lab, we realize that they are actually agent and we give them priority treatment. After the samples are sorted, we assign them lab numbers. As you can see over here, you see that there are some numbers on the sample bottles. We assign them. This lab numbers become an identification number of the sample throughout the analysis process from equipment to equipment and becomes an ID on the SOS report that you will be receiving. After that is done, we transfer. From the sampling taken or sampling we did, we realize that we filled some forms. One you can see as a sticker on the bottle and the other, which is a form that is submitted with a sample. Each sample sent to the lab has to come with them. And we transfer the lab number to this particular document and then submit it for registration as my colleague is working over there is doing. After that is done, we shake the sample quite vigorous. The idea is to make sure particles or everything in the bottle is evenly distributed before analysis starts and is distributed in such a way that how it stays in the compartment of your equipment during operation so that we can give you a significant accurate result. After that is shaken, we turn it upside down, which is part of the analysis. We turn it down for about an hour to allow the particles that are larger than we require for the analysis to settle. By this, we inspect the cap screw and we are able to see those particles and make comments and notes of them who become very important in the interpretation process. After all this is done, we, we take the portion of it, the first sample or the badge of sample, and we start our analysis. Due to sensitivity of the type to each type of analysis, the first analysis we start with is the wear element analysis. Please come with me as I show you how the sample is prepared for the elemental analysis. Over here is a sample preparatory equipment. It's automatic. All you say, you need to set it up and give it the instruction and equip a computer will do all the rest of the work. If you pick a bit, a bit of the sample as instructed, drop it into test tube and fetch a little of the solvent and dilute it, as you can see over here. Once this is diluted, we are ready to start our elemental analysis. This is where we do our elemental analysis. It's actually main, the main way we call it, or the field call it, is called wear analysis. But in each, in that analysis, are three categories. Part of it shows the additives that Michael was talking about earlier. The other side is the wear, and the, uh, the third one is the contaminant. These all become available but they are all known as elemental analysis. The equipment used for doing this analysis is called ICP. We have two different models of them from Pekinelma. They are state-of-the-art equipment recommended by Caterpillar for these purposes. Quite expensive, huge investment, but that is what Caterpillar wants because of its interest in its product 
and in your business as an investor in the equipment. Some pharmaceutical companies also use similar equipment. So why would we want to use it for Caterpillar use oil analysis? It's because of the relevance of your business to Caterpillar. After the oil analysis is completed, let me take you to the next analysis, which is the oil condition analysis. Over here is Pekinelma Oil Express 4. It's also automatic and does the analysis for oil condition. This is where we analyze the sample and test if the oil still have the ability to protect your system and lubricate it as it's supposed to do. When we check and it's actually not right or it has reduced its potency, then we make a recommendation on what you should do as a preventive maintenance man or as an engineer. The next is to check for the cleanliness of the oil. If you've ever wear your shoe or your boots and you have a, 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 a piece of stone or a pebble inside the shoe and you feel very uncomfortable until you remove that shoe, that is what happens when there are particles, contaminants inside the equipment compartment. And in such a way that as they move around each other, it begins to cut them. The discomfort you go through, for them, it cuts them. Then it becomes what you call aggravated wear, which causes your component to break down early. In order to investigate and see if the oil has such particles in it, this is the equipment we use. It's called particle counter. And this unit is a state-of-the-art equipment recommended by Caterpillar for all his laboratories. And this comes from Pekinelma. So we check the particles, and this is done for non-engine oil samples. After that is done, the engine samples which are left goes for TBN test. Let me take you to the next machine, which is used for TBN. Over here is fluid scan from spectral oil. This check the TBN. What is TBN? TBN is just a total base number, which is an alkaline ability of the oil Engine oil prepared during formulation to neutralize the, form for the formation of any acid in your engine crankcase during combustion. You agree with me that with the diesel fuel especially, you have so a lot of sulfur inside there, and with pressure in the engine crankcase, with heat, it's an air coming in with some moisture. It's in a congenial environment for the formation of sulfate acid and uh, oxid oxide uh, acid from oxidation. With this acid in the system, they become corrosive to your engine compartment. In order to prevent this, the oil formulation is done in such a way that as it's being done, your engine, the oil is able to neutralize the acid that is being formed. And one significant thing I want you to know about that TBN, which we are talking about, is that it has a, a value for the fresh oil. Once the TBN of your engine oil has reduced, reduced to half its value, you have to change that particular uh, oil from your compartment. And if you use SOS service, you will definitely realize this, and then we can put that one on the report for you as a recommendation. With the engine oil and then the oil cleanliness for the non-engine done, we put them together, and then we go for viscosity, which is our last equipment analysis test. Come with me. Over here is our viscosity machine. We call it viscometer. It's from ISL. And, and over here, we test for the viscosity. Viscosity is basically the resistance to flow in fluid. Okay? Then over here, we try to test if the oil grain you indicated on the oil submission form still have that particular result that we expect as viscosity for that particular oil grade or oil weight. Then we give you recommendation. For example, if there is fuel dilution, we expect your oil viscosity to reduce. If there is fluid transfer from a lower viscosity compartment to a higher viscosity compartment, the higher viscosity compartment will reduce in viscosity. And again, if the wrong choice of oil is made or a wrong information is submitted, we find something different from recommendation or your submission, then we make a recommendation for you during the data analysis. With all this, you are sure 
that the right analysis is done because the equipment you are using, they are actually the most quality and the high state of the act equipment for oil analysis. Thank you. Jason, over to you. Thank you very much, Xavier, for that. Uh... In-depth analysis in, in what kind of technology we deploy uh, in order to be able to provide our insights. Uh, it's not just about looking at wear and contamination. Vic viscosity plays a role. Also, the alkalinity of the fluid. So it was great to have that insight and in-depth uh, review of some of the tooling that we utilize. Now, team, that is our, Ga our Ghana uh, Kumasi area. We also have fluid analysis in Egypt and in Nigeria all with the same levels of technology, uh, so it is available across our regions. Now let's just jump back into the presentation. Thank you very much, Xavier. We will be coming back to you very shortly to see uh, now that you've done the fluid analysis, we've looked at taking the right sample, we've gone through, looked at the technology, we'll finish off a bit later is what do we do with all of these analytics and, uh, and analysis? How do we make the right decisions for our customers? So we'll touch base very shortly, uh, Xavier. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tristan. Now, the one thing I did want to touch on, team, is all about uh, what type. I just mentioned that, yes, we have three labs and all that kind of capability, but it is it is correct in saying that uh, all of these are Caterpillar certified labs. So we go through a rigorous process uh, with our OEM Caterpillar to ensure that we have the right practices and standards. We are ISO 9000 certified in quality management to ensure that we've documented all these uh, laboratory processes and we're up there to uh, execute on our promises. So the thing that I do want to point out is you know, a lot of our customers will say, you know, I think fluid analysis, it's something I can cut and it's only for the big guys, it's not for me. Uh, this really isn't the case. We have over 2,800 customers registered on SOS that are actively utilizing this product and service. We've done over 100,000 samples to date across all of our territories. And just like I was mentioning before, uh, not everything is about just Caterpillar. It is also non-cat as well. So a quarter of all of our sampling is actually non-CAT equipment, whether that's within construction, within power systems, even things like agriculture, the aviation industry, we're able to do sampling in non-traditional Caterpillar territories or non-traditional uh, industries. So we're able to sample whatever fluids you're, you're willing to offer us. And of course, the most important thing is right at the bottom there, those 4,000 plus insights that we like to say. So whenever we get a sample and there may be the possibility of an issue, we always contact the customer immediately to let them know, hey, please stop your machine, stop your power gen. Uh, there is a detected issue, retest or let's investigate further. We save customers tens of thousands of dollars in doing this service. Of course, it comes as standard uh, whenever you do a sampling with us. We're all here to, to provide that preventative action to save you guys money, save you guys downtime when it comes to your equipment. And when we're talking about saving money and, and downtime and all this sort of stuff, it's really about taking those um, test results and turning them into potential resolutions. And here's just an example of a couple of compartments where whether that's a diesel engine or we're looking at transmissions, uh, we're able to uh, identify key areas or key wear uh, implement or um, uh, results that may indicate a possible source of an issue. From there, we're able to recommend a repair option that will best suit uh, the customer or suggest a bit of a technical uh, inspection and look over what may be going wrong. But again, what we're trying to see here or demonstrate here is when we have those results, we're able to make the appropriate recommendations based on decades long experience from Caterpillar or OEM. So we know that whatever recommendation we're giving comes back with a whole heap of data to support it. Now, we've talked about fluids, we've talked a little bit about the technology as well behind CAD SOS, but let's talk about the complete end-to-end uh, -end spectrum. So let's talk about our filtration system. And in saying that, I think if John, if you're on the line. Uh, I am. Fantastic. So we'll be crossing over to, to John now. John, again, like I mentioned before, over 20 plus years in the filtration business for Caterpillar, a worldwide or global expert. He'll run us through filtration products 
uh, and show us a little bit behind some of the technology that we deploy uh, in order to accomplish uh, that reduced over, uh, overall owning and operating cost. So, John, when you're ready, please take it away. All right. One second here. Let me get my uh, presentation up and running. Okay. Can you see everything all right? Everything's A-OK. -okay. All right. Great. So, uh, as Tristan said, uh, my name is John McConnell. Um, and then uh, I'm coming to you from the U.S. this morning, so uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, I'll be talking with you a little bit about filtration. Uh, and, and like Tristan said earlier, I've been with uh, Caterpillar for well over 20 years, and, and most of that time has been with filtration and fluids, so uh, a lot of background with these products. So I, I think the uh, most important thing about – oh, my thing's not uh, – there we go. The most important thing about filtration products that you need to know is, you know, Caterpillar got into the filtration business uh, specifically for uh, helping you lower your owning and operating costs, right? Uh, and the same thing with the fluids. Uh, it's not about selling you a filter or fluid. It's really about making sure you get the performance and life out of your equipment that you expect. And that's really why we're in the business. And when you think about owning and operating costs, there are different things that uh, play into that. And the first one, obviously, when we're talking about filtration, is there's the initial cost of the filters. So, yes, you know, there is an expense there to, to purchase these products. Uh, but there's also the uh, how, how those filters perform. Uh, do they meet your change intervals? Uh, do you get the expected life out of those products that you're getting the money out of those products? And do they protect your components uh, and your system? Because that's ultimately why you're buying these products. I want to make sure that these products do their job, that uh, I get the life out of my components, I get to my expected rebuilds, and I don't have downtime in between those standard intervals that, that cost me a, a machine uptime. So it's really important when you think about purchasing these products that it's more than just the cost at, when you buy them. It's what those products do for you and, and how they allow you to get the life and performance out of your equipment. Now, I, I think this slide was on a little earlier in a little different format under Michael's uh, presentation, but I want to reiterate that, you know, filters and fluids are that 3 to 5% of the cost of uh, operating your equipment, uh, but they do have a huge impact on some of the other areas of your expenses. Uh, repairs, for example, if I have to take a machine down early or I have to replace injectors early or turbos or something like that, those areas of the owning and operating costs go up significantly. So, yes, filters and fluids are an expense, but they're a very small portion of that expense, and saving a little bit here can cost you in other areas uh, of, of uh, owning and operating costs on your equipment. So it's really important to make the right decisions. So when you think about reducing your owning and operating costs, there's really three things I'm going to touch on here real briefly today. Uh, number one is keeping it clean. And, uh, you know, there's been a big focus so far on SOS, and, and it is extremely important. Keeping those systems clean is, is really important. Number two, we're going to talk about keeping it cat. And what we mean by that is using the right products in your system so you recognize the performance out of that equipment. And number three is keep it consistent. And we're, there we're talking about maintenance practices. Make sure you're doing the right things time and time again when you touch that equipment so that uh, you get the life and performance out of it. So first and foremost, with keeping it clean, um, what we're talking about here is why are we worried about keeping that system clean and what does it do for us to keep that system clean? If you uh, cannot keep your system clean and you get contamination in your system, basically the things that it costs you is, first of all, your fluid life. Uh, SOS is going to tell you to change out that fluid, and that means I'm dropping fluid. I have expenses now of more product. I have disposal costs of getting rid of the old product. So you have an expense there. Uh, as well as short component life, if I have to replace injectors earlier than I would like, or if I have to do a top end or, or, or a, a minor overhaul on that engine early, all that drives additional cost to your business. And then reduce productivity. Just is the machine putting out the level of work that you expect? Uh, as you get contamination in your hydraulic system, you'll lose 20, 25% of the performance before you, the operator even notices. So, very important that you keep those systems clean so they actually perform as expected. And then it, it could lead with excessive contamination to a catastrophic failure. Much more uh, unlikely, uh, but it, it is a possibility that can cause you extreme downtime and cost you significant uh, amount of expense. So all these things uh, contribute uh, to the cost of uh, operating your equipment. 
Now, contamination, how much contamination are we talking about? It doesn't take a lot, especially in your, your, your tighter systems, like your fuel system and your hydraulic system. You get a little bit of contamination in there now, and it, it tends to uh, recirculate through the system. So it's really important that you have filtration on the system that captures it quickly and holds on to it until you can swap that filter out. Otherwise, that that material is going to continue to cycle through your system, and you're going to generate more and more debris over time. So good quality filtration is extremely important. And the type of debris that we're getting out, uh, historically, it used to be, you know, 15, 20, 30 micron size stuff. Uh, and when you think of a micron, uh, a human hair, the diameter of a human hair is about 80 microns. The smallest thing you can see with your eye is about 40 microns. And the particles that we're having to get out of the systems today in your fuel are like three, four microns. Hydraulic system, you're talking about six to 10 microns. Uh, so it's tiny particles that you will never see. That's what is affecting your systems today. So high level, good quality filtration is extremely important to make sure that uh, your, your systems are gonna live uh, the life that they expect. And with that, you know, just your general practices on handling your parts, keep your parts stored indoors and, and protected as much as possible. Uh, if you have fluids that you're storing on site, be they drums or pails or things like that, make sure those are stored indoors if at all possible. If not, keep the tops covered uh, so that you're not building up moisture and debris uh, uh, near the, the breathe holes, you know, the bung holes on the on the the, the uh, tanks, and then uh, make sure you're, you're, you're keeping those areas clean uh, so that you're not ingesting debris as that, uh, those tanks sit there and, and breathe in and out with temperature changes. So also your fuel supplier, make sure he's delivering you clean, dry fuel. Really, really important. They're not required to give you any level of fuel. It's up to you to make sure that you're getting clean, dry fuel from your supplier. Uh, so testing your fuel is, is always a good practice periodically, and your dealer can help you with that. First in, first out, uh, you know, don't stockpile parts and, and have one sit on the back shelf for a year or two. Make sure you cycle your parts through. And then filter all fluids as you put them on the machine. Very, very important not to introduce debris into the system so that now your filtration on your machines have to work harder to get that out. So always filter fluids going into your equipment. So keeping it cat or, or using the right components on your Equipment, very, very important. Obviously, Caterpillar has all the filtration products that you're going to need to service your equipment, whether they be liquid, air, or cabin filtration. Uh, and with that, we have different types of filtration. I hope everyone is aware that we have standard efficiency, advanced efficiency, and ultra-high efficiency products. All of those products are built to the same standards, uh, so you get the same quality build and the same manufacturing expertise, regardless of which type of product it is. But what you get is you get a product that's focused on a specific size of particles that it's trying to capture. So most of your equipment today, newer equipment, is coming out with at least advanced efficiency products on it. Uh, what Caterpillar recommends is that you use advanced efficiency when you service that, or you can move up and use better. You can use ultra-high efficiency. But we don't recommend that you move down to a lower level uh, filter to, based on what came on your equipment from the factory. That equipment requires a specific level of performance uh, to protect that system. So just be aware of that to make sure you're using, not only that you're using a good quality product as far as brand goes, but that you're using the right level of filtration efficiency so that you're protecting that system. So Caterpillar products, I hope you're all familiar with those. Obviously, there's a lot of, 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 of special features of the Caterpillar product. The spiral roving and acrylic beading are in there to make sure that the media captures and retains particles uh, during operation. You know, we have a urethane, end caps, and non-metallic center tube are there for cleanliness. So all of these different features that are on the Caterpillar product are there for a specific reason, and they've been in the Caterpillar products for many, many years. So this is technology that we're very familiar with and that Caterpillar manufactures uh, specifically for our equipment. We don't make products for anyone else, and no one else really makes a product exactly like Caterpillar filtration products in the industry. So these are very unique products that are designed and manufactured exclusively for Caterpillar uh, to protect our equipment so you get the performance out of it. 
So very important to understand that. Uh, and so when you are looking at other products, know the type of products that you're buying and know the quality of those products that you're buying. And we do a lot of industry testing. Uh, uh, Tristan mentioned it earlier in the presentation, you know, 45% longer injector life. And that comes from some on-engine studies that we have done over the years where we actually introduce uh, dirty f fuel into the system, and then we, we measure the performance of the Caterpillar product against the other products in the industry. And we consistently outperform uh, everyone. And a lot of that has to do with the manufacturing of our products, that it is differentiated, it is in specific Caterpillar facilities, and also just the features and benefits, the way the product is put together and designed. It allows us to capture and retain more particles as that filter is used on the equipment, which is very, very important. Because when you're on the equipment, it's different than when you're on a test bench as far as performance goes. So yes, you get longer life out of the Caterpillar products and you get better performance. It protects those components, which means overall, your owning and operating cost is greatly reduced. So when you look at the CAT compared to competition, yes, you're probably going to pay a little more for CAT uh, filters right out of the box because we are a premium product, but as you get more life out of those components, your cost per hour and your overall owning and operating cost drop significantly. So it is a great cost saver for you uh, to use the right products that are designed for the CAT system. And, and we can see that when we look at what the competitors do, everybody makes a very similar product when you talk about their testing in the lab. The performance looks very similar, but it's only when you get it on the equipment that you see a difference. And that really comes down to when a filter's on the piece of equipment, it's, uh, it's, it's affected by pulsations, heat, vibration, all those other things that come into play in operation that aren't in a lab test, which is why you see so much difference between the performance of the CAT product on engine versus in a laboratory. So really important that, you you know, there's a lot of engineering and design work behind the CAT products that make them optimized uh, for the Caterpillar equipment. And that really goes for the air filters as well. When you move over to the air side, there is a little bit of difference. We have standard efficiency and ultra high efficiency products. Uh, but air filters are really designed to get more efficient over time as you use them. So you put a brand new air filter on, there's going to be some material actually getting through that to your engine until that filter builds up a dust cake and gets to its maximum efficiency level. Now, Caterpillar does have an option to use an ultra high efficiency, which has a very fine media fiber on the outside. So that allows that dust cake to build up very, very quickly, which means I'm getting to my maximum efficiency much more quickly. And I surface load parts so I can get rid of those parts as the machine's in operation. It sheds parts to the bottom of the can and ejects them out through the little evacuator valve, that little rubber boot on the bottom of your air filter housing. So those things take place, so I get better performance as far as life and capturing the right particles and the amount of time that I can get out of that filter when it's in service on my equipment. So air filters, extremely important, and you know, we've done a lot of testing there as well. Air filters are very, very dependent on application and environment for how long they're going to last and whether you can get a uh, significant amount of hours out of them. But what we've seen with the CAT UHE product is you do get much longer life out of those products and you get better protection uh, of your components because we retain and capture more of those particles and don't allow them, allow them to get into the engine air intake system. So again, just like with the liquid filters, as you look at those, yes, the CAT air filters will be slightly more expensive but you will get uh, more and better performance out of them, which lowers your overall owning and operating cost. Now, with air filters, a little bit to remember on there is Caterpillar does recommend that you change off of restriction uh, and not change off of hours, but we know a lot of people will change off of a specific hour basis. Uh, we recommend restriction because you're going to get the maximum life out of that product. Uh, it's hard to look at an air filter and say, I need to change it because it's dirty, uh, but uh, air restriction will tell you when that filter starts to plug too much uh, that it needs then to be changed out. Uh, so it's really important to try to change off restriction, but if you are going to change off of hours, make sure you're optimizing for your application and environment. Uh, you know, run a filter test and make sure you're getting the maximum amount of hours you are before you swap that product out. So it's really, really important 
to get the life out of these premium products and to keep that system closed as much as possible. Caterpillar also does not recommend that you clean air filters. I know it, it's uh, a lot of air filter manufacturers will say that, that you can clean sometimes. But if you, you look here at some of the pictures, we're actually showing a new filter on the left. You see the media is all intact. It looks good. The middle picture is showing uh, a, a good air filter that has been used. It's dirty. You see all those particles that are surface loaded there on that fine media. And then the filter on the right is showing you a cleaned air filter. And it just shows you the type of damage that you introduce when you try to clean air filtration products. So when you damage that media, uh, what that allows is for more particles to find its way through, which means, and a lot of our testing has shown, you have significantly more debris getting through and more wear happening in the engine. So that's going to require you to dig into that engine a little bit earlier. Maybe I'm only going to get nine or 10,000 hours before I have to do a top end uh, rebuild on that engine instead of getting the 12 or 15 or 16,000 hours out of that engine. So you think you might be saving some money by cleaning your air filters, but as you look at the life of that engine, you're actually costing yourself more money by introducing more debris into that system. So really, really important that you have good maintenance practices in, in that space. And that leads us into what some of the maintenance practice tips are. Um, we always recommend you follow the OMM. Caterpillar has specific recommendations out there for what the hours are and what tasks need to be performed at each service interval. So make sure you do those at the recommended intervals. Do your visual inspections. Uh, talk to your operators. Make sure that he's, uh, your operators are looking at the equipment and they're, they're telling you when things are starting to make noise or, or not perform the way they expect. Do the good visual inspections. Change your intervals, your filters on time. Do your greasing. Uh, really follow what the OMM says to help minimize any premature uh, failures, okay? And, and all that information is available both online and in paper copies. Uh, and, and also we recommend that you have a good checklist in place for your technicians. Make sure they're doing the same thing each and every time so that your those machines see consistent performance and consistent maintenance, right? It's more than just dropping the oil and spinning off a filter. Check your hoses. Uh, check your, your coolant package, check your radiator cores for any plugging. All those things can be put into a checklist so that the guys that service your equipment do the right thing every time that they go out and service that piece of equipment. And when you're changing filters, always change filters uh, in, in the same way. Uh, just like when you take your SOS sample, you need to clean the area around uh, your, your filters so you don't have debris falling off and getting into the housing uh, or getting onto the new filter as you're trying to spin it on. So clean the area around uh, your filter. Also, always keep your filters in their original packaging until you're ready to install them on the equipment. Don't take a new filter, pull it out of the box, take off the cellophane, sit it on the tire while you go remove the old filter, right? So keep that new filter in its packaging, spin off the old one, and then take the new filter out of its packaging and install it. You really want to minimize the amount of debris that you're introducing into the system, especially your hydraulic and your fuel systems. Do not pre-fill filters. Uh, very, very important because you're, when you pre-fill a filter, you're putting dirty uh, liquid into the clean side of the media so that, me that fluid will not go through any media before it goes uh, directly to your engine or other system. So do not pre-fill filters, especially your fuel filters. And use ultra-high efficiency filters anytime you open up the hydraulic system for servicing. Use the UHE to clean that system up quickly, and then you can go back to your standard or advanced efficiency filter over time. Again, another thing would be check your, air fil check your fuel filters and your lube filters. Cut them open. It's a good check, and it's a good immediate check. I know you're probably pulling samples, SOS, and sending them off to the lab, but the great thing about cutting open your filters is you can get immediate results right then. You can cut that filter open, look, make sure the element's intact. You can cut out a piece of the media and spread it out and look and see, do I see any debris in there? Do I see any shiny particles? I can run a magnet over it and look for ferrous metals. Uh, I can see if there's any large debris, things that aren't even going to show up in the SOS sample. So this is a great, quick, easy check to do and get an immediate look at what's going on inside your equipment. Uh, 
Also, you want to look for any organic materials, algae or slime, any kind of buildup like that. Any organic materials that you're going to see on the media uh, is going to tell you you have water in your system, right? You have to have water to have organic growth. So another quick way to see if you've got any water ingress in some of your systems. So very important for doing an immediate check and not wait for the SOS to come back. And really the last thing I want to leave you with is for filling up your equipment with fuel, Caterpillar recommends that you filter the fuel as it goes into the equipment. Now I'm not saying you have to buy a Caterpillar bulk filtration system or, or a portable system, but I am saying make sure you have good practices in place to do something to filter that fuel before you put it into the equipment. It will uh, pay you back uh, very well because it's going to allow your onboard filtration to filter properly and get to their life, and it will allow all of your components to meet the expected life and performance uh, that you expect. So really extremely important that uh, you, you filter the fuel, especially I know Africa doesn't have the cleanest fuel uh, in the world. So really important to make sure I'm not putting dirt and debris into my system uh, when I'm fueling it up. So that's really all I had for you today. I appreciate your attention. And uh, any questions, we'll probably cover those a little bit later. And Tristan, I think uh, it's back to you. Yeah, great. Thank you for that, John. Very uh, in-depth look at what it takes to uh, have, a, have and manufacture our cap filtration uh, systems, but then also to go into those helpful tips. Uh, there are a lot of questions about pre-filling, um, so it was good that you touched on that. I'll probably get you to touch on it a little bit more uh, later on in the Q&A. Um, yeah, that works. But, uh, even the uh, helpful tips of cutting open filtration, uh, it's, it's a very simple, handy tool to do, and it'll actually give you a lot of insight before anything like SOS or anything like that. So, in saying that, I think what we'll do next is, if Xavier, you're still there, we'd love to cross back to you. Xavier, can you hear us? I can see he's jumped off mute. So what Xavier will be doing next for us is going through, uh, now that we've gone through the, a bit of a journey in terms of sampling technology, Xavier's actually going to be showing us just how, just what we do with those uh, reports, analyses, and how we can make recommendations, or how you yourselves can look through with my.cat.com and see how to make uh, the best recommendations for your machines. Hello. Now I can hear you there, Savior. Yes. Hello, Tristan. <laughs> he's back, uh, and he's in front of his laptop as well. So Savior yes. will run through some of those. Uh, helpful tips, so things like what we do with the with the SOS uh, results, and then how that feeds your little customer portal uh, through my.cat.com. So, Xavier, please take it away for one more time. Thank you very much, Tristan. I welcome you and the viewers back to their lab. Now we are going to take you through the details of what data analysis looks like. In front of me is the SOS manager that I've spoken of many times during the process. It's the SOS manager that I've spoken about so many times during the earlier process. Those are previous results of what we have done. But let me take the team straight, the conference straight to where the data is analyzed. In front of me are data on equipment. And then you can see a 785 equipment details over there, with the equipment details and the customer details all showing. We have sessions of the every detail. We have wear elements, we have samples, we have fluid information that the customer provided we've inputted. We have the physical condition of the oil, where we have fuel and water, TBN and viscosity. Then we have the oil condition where we have suit oxidation and sulfation, I spoke about earlier. Then the interpretation. Inside the wear element, we have the categories where you have the calcium and all those stuff being oil additives. They tell you the quality of the oil you are using. And then we have the other details. After the analyst or the interpreter, take a look at all this. He therefore translate them into a meaningful understanding to the customer or the PM team of the customer. There are some unique qualities that I want to talk about 
SOS manager, which Caterpillar has provided, which are comparable to nothing so far. Often our customers will tell you, your analysis, the technical content is just perfect for us, and it reduces our workload in troubleshooting. So I'm taking you first one is the is the is the or the wire table that Caterpillar has provided. This has been studied over ages of the history of Caterpillar equipment. And it tells you the limits to which every wear element goes or every debt component goes that it should be considered of concern, slightly of concern, or really of concern. What we call it action required, monitor compartment, and then no action required. Again, there is also a, a reference data for the oil condition where we have limits, as you can see on my screen. This is a huge document. I have to take this portion from it from Caterpillar that the interpreter uses. You see all the oil condition and their details, even coolant and all those stuff, as we see on the table, on the screen. You can see water contaminants and their percentage and what it matters to us. You can see transmission and other compartments and their upper and lower limits. You can see even specific treatment to specific equipment engine models in the C criteria, the C series engine criteria. And then the one for the gas oil parameters as well. So the interpreter have these details available in addition to the wear limit, which you call wear table. The next one is the machine profile. The machine profile gives the interpreter the ability to tell the engineer or the equipment uh, preventive team exactly which element that comes and the compartment is coming from. For example, if you see in front of me, you see this is an engine for this criteria of equipment. And then if you look at the recommendation and the ion, as you can see there, you see what and which compartment or parts they are coming from. The same happens if you have other compartments on the same equipment model like transmission. You see ion and what is happening. So the moment we see the well level, the interpreter knows exactly what decision or what recommendation to get, give the customer. With this, the time interval for troubleshooting is limited because you go straight to what is happening, check it, if it is right, then you go ahead and implement what a caterpillar recommendation on the repairs of that component has given you. And in this lab, we have four qualified CAT certified interpreters in Ghana here. And I know this is the same across the Mantra sub region in Nigeria and Egypt. So after the interpretation has been done, we've seen all the data. We do the interpretation, as you can see in the column, in the interpret uh, typing column over there. It is explained. Then it, the recommendation is added. Say, so please continue schedule sampling. Then down below or at the bottom there, we have what you call sample overall evaluation. Evaluation. By this, we assign recommendation. Another recommendation will become color coded on the report that the customer will see. The first over there we say no action required, as I spoke about earlier. It means equipment is all right and you can continue your operation. The next is monitor compartment. Over there, there is a slight concern that you have to keep monitoring or there is some small changes you have to make. Possibly sometimes even the operation, the mode of operation. The next one is action required. At that level, there is need for a major investigation into the recommendation that has been made. And then you take the necessary action. Below it is no comment. And I always tell our customers that once you see no comment, it means your report, the, the, the analyst or the interpreter is not confident in the result that he has gotten. And because he can't just say you anything, he tell you no comment. That means that you should take a sample under supervision for analysis. After all this is done, the data is saved, interpretation is completed, the data is saved, and then it goes straight into the customer's email. 
it's also dis it, um, it distributed so that it goes to the customer's email. In the customer's email, this is the picture you see. You receive the mails in this succession with all the details. It indicates whether action required or not. It says no action required, as you can see here. <coughs> it indicates the equipment details. That is the customer assigned number or asset number. Then you see the serial, manufacturer serial number. With this, you, there's another one you can see here shows monitor compartment, and there are others that shows action required. With this, you can quickly open the PDF attached copy because each one that comes comes with a PDF attached copy. So if you should open the PDF attached copy, you can see the details and print it out of there straight, or you can action the recommendation. But again, that gives the customers a platform where they can go and make a detailed equipment monitoring decision. And this is called MCC in brief or my.card.com. And if you are a customer and you don't have access to this and you are enjoying the SOS service, please contact your local uh, dealership, especially within the Mantra zone, you contact us in any of our Mantra territories and they will give you access account to assess your reports. So let me quickly take you to my.card.com for us to take a look at what happens over there. When you have the assets and you open the page, this is what you see as a customer. You see all the details. If I were equipment health, subscription summary, if I were having I were a customer and I have the details, you will see a lot of details displayed over here right now with various alert levels telling you that something, either there is a fault that you have to go and attend on to on your equipment. Again, if you want to bypass, there are a lot of quick links, as you can see below there, that directs you to where you go and what it can help you to do. If you want to bypass, you enter the bypass, it takes you straight there, you identify your path or your path number, and then you, you make your request for a quotation, then you do your buying. One other one I want to indicate is the vision link. Are you concerned? about alert level coming and even your operator doesn't know or your operator doesn't alert you? Are you concerned about why your equipment is operating? I remember John was talking about productive hours of the equipment with effect to contamination. Are you concerned to know whether equipment is in operation yet the productive hours is not high? Are you concerned about your fuel level? Then Vision Link is the right tool for you. But right now, I'll take you straight to the SOS application which is the paramount issue for our SOS report analysis. So I click on this. I think there's a little bit of delay there. As the page is now opening. You have to accept the cookies because without it, it will not allow you access to continue. Over here, I'll take you to the reports. So I'll take, you, I'll take you to the samples. So I'll click on this, since we have limited time. Okay. As the, job, as the page is opening, I want to take you to the overall evaluations that we discussed in the SOS manager, which the interpreter assigned to your report. You can see this is the outlook. We have the no action required checked in green. Then you have monitor compartment on a yellow background with an injunction sign. Then you have action required with a red on in a red triangle. Then we have agent can, uh, agent sample or action required samples that you have to attend to immediately. If an agent sample is sent to you, even when the equipment is trying to do extra work that might take a longer period, it's advisable that you move the equipment to a very safe working zone where you can go and carry out the investigation and quickly take the necessary investigation action on that equipment. This is our no action required I spoke about earlier. And whenever we receive your sample from you as a customer and we enter the data as you see my colleague was doing, Immediately, you see this sign with a bottle, a lab bottle with the red on it over here, indicating not interpreted. It means 
they have started processing your report and the customer can see this. So you are confident to wait for the report or ask how quickly you can get it depending on the agency of your the need. So over here are some of our customers' report because uh, I am a dealer, I can see quite a lot of them. But I quickly wanted, I want to take you to one of the, the details that we will be looking for. You have equipment health. You have above here, you see all the asset histories or the, the documents that you have on the, your report. And you can decide to filter it more to suit what you are, the criteria you are looking for. For example, if you want to check the status, you want to check sample dates, you have all these details to know uh, the right action or the filter to do. And this will help you to get your own criteria. If you are working for something very specific, the need is to click on the filter. And then on the add filter, you check what exactly you want. The very details you have in the filter there are here, but this helps you to choose one particular equipment or a criteria that meets your need at that moment. For example, over here, I'll choose asset ID, and then I'll enter for one particular asset that will help us get the details of what we want. You click OK, and then you apply. As this is open, I also want to indicate that there is a help sheet on that page you click on, which can tell you how to navigate your way around and get the details of what you want uh, from the MCC or on the report displayed page. As the detail is opening, I want to take you to one particular report that is of use to us. Um, let me take you here. We spoke about lab numbers that we assigned to the sample. One of them is, some of them are what are displayed over here. So we're going to click on one of such reports and we'll see the details on. When you click on the report, the sample number, it becomes your report ID. You have all the details on your equipment, compartment, and sample information displayed over here. If you feel there is need to do editing or something is not correct, you can contact us or we'll also show you how to do it on your own. Down there is a display of results. During interpretation, the interpreter, as you can see, see a lot of results that, that you can even see as a, a, a customer. The buildup of results in this particular order, as you can see here with the CESA, is called trending. And the idea for trending is that where the white table cannot apply, Use the trend to determine the behavior of that particular equipment compartment in that particular locality or that climate. For example, if let's say you are working in a, an environment and like an iron ore, and a little depth in your compartment become also give an extra uh, ppm or measure or concentration of iron. But when you are using trending, you are able to figure this out and to be able to eliminate all the excesses, excesses and give the right interpretation. Again, there, is, there are a lot of activities you can do. If you want to print the PDF for maybe your uh, technicians or the engineers to go and act on, you click on the PDF icon. Maybe you want to plot a graph and do certain analysis on equipment. Maybe you are buying an equipment. They give you access to the table. So you click on the graph. It opens for you. Then you have the page to decide what exactly to select. For example, maybe I want to select the well reading as against that. So I choose my well, possible well elements. I have copper, iron, lead, and then I pick chrome. Then what are the things that contribute to that? We have aluminum, and we have silicon being major contributors as signs of dead contamination. As I'm plotting, it's so quick and it's very worker friendly. You can already see the graph that has already plotted. So the graph is plotted there for you to be able to view. And then you can make decision on the progress of improvement or equipment compartment or not. With this and many other more, you're able to apply it as quickly as possible. 
to decide what exactly to get from the MCC. I must indicate that there have been various uh, recent uh, occurrences of success stories, but one particular one was from an underground equipment where we have interpreted, you can see the trend of results showing red. And after the third one, the customer decided to investigate and not just change oil, to investigate what actually is causing the red indication or actually required or urgent required that we have been submitting. And on investigation, you can see this is the final drive of that particular underground loader. And you can see the crack around the career of that final drive. Can you just imagine what would have happened if this underground loader has got broken down on a steep slope under the, uh, at the underground? The trouble it would take them to move it to a level ground to work on it. The labor hours it would take for the mechanics, the operator being idle, and the productive cost, if it had been blocking a strategic operational cost, you would have imagined what would have happened. But with the help of SOS service, as Caterpillar has designed it to serve the customer better, you can see the exact result that it has yielded. The, the equipment was moved up uphill and was taken out of the pit, worked on as quickly as possible, and returned to job. And the benefits are very are phenomenal, as I'm going to discuss with you. The first one is to predict breakdown. As the picture we have shown to you and the SOS report has shown, then it tells you to also schedule the repairs. Because with this already in mind, you know which parts you need to do the repairs. And you order them in time, then you are able to do it well. With that, it means that you cut down the downtime for repairs. Because the machine wouldn't break down before you investigate and realize it and go for the spare parts. But with the SOS report, you know the spare parts you will need. So you make preparation for it, and the downtime for the repair or the restoration of that equipment to operation is cut very short. By this, it helps you to manage equipment. You know the condition of which equipment to set far away or closer during your operation, so that if this one cannot be trusted because of SOS as recommended, and you can even see from the malfunctioning movement of the operation, you can decide which equipment in your fleet to use as where and as what time. Then with all this, you can also help you to be able to plan your spare inventory, which spares to keep and which spares to only wait on when the need comes. Then it also reduces the cost of operation, uh, managing your equipment, because making decisions becomes very accurate and very possible. The next is it reduces the workload. You know which exact assignment to assign to which mechanics. Since most of our mechanics nowadays have special abilities in certain areas. Maybe somebody is very good at transmission, whilst others are good at maybe the engine. Then you assign them very well, then the workload is, released, is reduced. The one important one to people who are buying machine or are renting machine is to ask for the history of SOS reports over their time. It helps you to identify which equipment you rent, and that way you rent it, it do not go and break down during the operation and make you lose your contract. And it also helps you to know which equipment or use equipment to buy. Because once it has been used before, you don't know what is happening inside that machine. But with the history of SOS reports, and if they give you access to MCC and you're able to plot the graph, you can know the life of that equipment and whether it has reached a repair stage or not. With all this involved, you agree with me that SOS service, is an accurate preventive services tool to do your work in comfort and make maximum out of your business. Thank you very much. Over to you, Tristan. Uh, Xavier, I most certainly agree with you. Uh, it most certainly uh, assists in that preventative maintenance and what you've kind of highlighted today and shown us 
really takes us through that whole journey of how our customers can save on their total repair costs. Uh, thank you very much for your time, very in-depth. For those that are interested, we have had some questions about my.cat.com. So just like what Xavier said, please contact your local dealer. We are able to get you online free of charge and get your fleet in there so you can start seeing insights immediately. So please feel free to contact your local dealer for that. Xavier, thank you very much. And we'll talk Thank to you, you during the Q&A session. Very insightful. Thank you very much. But now let's return to the presentation just before we close. So the way in which kind of we or within Mantrack like to bundle this up uh, when we're talking parts or, or services or even equipment management like Mantrack SOS uh, is through something that we call a CVA. Now, traditionally, we used to call this, you may be familiar with the CSA, the Customer Support Agreement or uh, sometimes Customer Service Agreement. So these are service contracts that we actually tailor made for our customers in the future so that you, everyone can benefit from the equipment management that we've spoken about today, but also getting those genuine parts when you need them. So a CVA is really all about flexibility. It's about having that a complete package for equipment management. Now, what we've been doing within Mantrack is gaining this understanding that our customers want super flexibility, not only from a service perspective, but also from a financial cash flow perspective as well. So what we have here are tiered services and service offerings that we support uh, both CAT and non-CAT equipment with. So from the uh, left hand side all the way through to the right, you can see that we start from basic all the way to TMNR. So really basic is about those people out there that have their own service capabilities, but really only just want you know the parts on the shelf, the, rank, the recommended uh, PM parts provided, and also that insight from things like CAT SOS and that technology. So you can get a package tailored just for you guys, so your service guys can go ahead and fit what's required when it's required. For our service contracts, we still offer them. Of course, they're our more traditional CSA style things. So that's your parts and service and, and labor included there. So that's where you'll get a Mantrack Caterpillar certified technician out there to do all the PMs, maintenance, potential repairs, uh, and we can tailor that to, you, to suit your needs. Again, we put everything in terms of health, operations, all that sort of stuff, connectivity, uh, and more certainly, uh, with every service completion, you get a CAT inspect inspection uh, to ensure that everything's done uh, as per the recommended OMM. And of course, for those uh, high production uh, customers of ours, whether that's in electric power or in quarries or in mining, we do have the total maintenance and repair contract. This is more of a cost per hour, utilizing more advanced condition monitoring techniques like CAT ECA, Equipment Care Advisor. So that's a predictive tool that we utilize uh, from our technology suite. And also it's really about driving the, low, the highest uptime while providing the lowest owning and operating costs, utilizing technology uh, and our equipment know-how. Now, that's just from a service perspective in terms of flexibility. On the other side, we have uh, that, the financial flexibility. Now, this is really when a CVA comes into its own. So having these service contracts dovetailed in with new flexible payment options means that you can maximize your profitability without having to have that expensive upfront payment that can sometimes come with buying genuine parts and service. So now we're trying to really mitigate that potential cash flow issue by providing different payment methods. So you can pay as you go, cancel any time as you wish, or you can pay by the hour. Utilizing our telematic suite vision link, we're able to monitor your equipment and you can pay as your hourly interval uh, comes up in a very easy monthly invoice. Of course, all those invoices will be shown uh, through whatever customer portal that you utilize as well. And of course, for those that have perhaps uh, some cash flow within the budget, uh, there's always the continuation of pay up front where you do get some significant savings. Of course, all of our CVA uh, structures, they come free with product link installed. Uh, of course, you get one year uh, subscription. Everything comes with a TA1 in inspection as standard. So that's just a, an additional uh, benefit for peace of mind. We'll have a technician or a sales professional come out, perform a TA1 for your uh, particular fleet. And of course, we do now offer, offer parts shipped direct to your door. So no longer do you need to come pick them up. You can go on online through PCC or we can have them 
shifts direct to you. So we've got this new level of flexibility and capabilities that really allows us to mold with your particular business. So what we're really trying to drive is that hassle-free ownership, the flexible options, so whether, whether that's uh, from a commercial aspect or from a servicing aspect, we are much more flexible. Of course, when you're working with Mantrack, we are the Caterpillar distributor and dealership uh, across multiple territories. You do get that sense of security. We are there with multiple touch points across the entire assets life cycle. We're here from beginning to end, uh, which is integral. And of course, peace of mind when it comes to health management. Technology and the, and the adoption of technology within our industries will be key and transformational for really getting those big revenue returns. The thing that everybody's looking at at the moment is operational expense and the best methodology, whether you're in developed or developing areas, is really to implement very basic standards of technology practice, monitoring, being able to collect data to be utilized for insights. That will continue all the way through for the next two decades. Very important to get on this technology suite. And of course, whenever we've been talking about uh, our type of CVAs and what we have on offer, uh, it's important to say that there is a CVA that suits all of our customer base, regardless of industry, regardless of size. We currently have over 6,000 units under a Mantrax CVA offering. So it means we're able to fit with our customers a lot more and we're able to provide a service that is unique to your value proposition. And of course, most importantly, we keep talking about that predictive measures. And just over the, uh, over the number of years, we've managed to do uh, a total of over plus 140,000 total red alerts generated. So that means we're able to contact our customers on time every time and say, hey guys, there's something wrong, let's, have, let's help, let's troubleshoot before we get to some kind of catastrophic failure. Again, saving our customers, just another uh, value add when it comes to a CVA. Okay, it's Q&A time, so now it's time to solve your challenges. Now we have our experts on the line, we are able to take questions, um, so keep them coming through and we'll be able to uh, send them on to all of our different experts. Like I said, on the right hand side is the Q&A buttons there, so just send your questions through and we'll be able to uh, submit them through to our four guys. Now, let's kick off, I'll just go through my handy dandy notebook and see what we have here. Okay, uh, this one's for the ExxonMobil gentleman. Uh, so gents from Exxon, so there was a question here, why can't we just buy Exxon, uh, ExxonMobil oil? Uh, is there anything different between that and cat oil since you, you, you make both oils? Thank you, Tristan. So um, very good question indeed. Uh, there is a big difference between both products and uh, ExxonMobil, uh, as we said during our uh, presentation, is uh, blending the product and under the copyrights of uh, Caterpillar. Um, again, uh, the only product that passed through the proprietary testing of Caterpillar and uh, uh, the field demonstration and all the tests that, that passed through and the only product that's approved by Caterpillar for the CAT engines is the CAT Genuine Oil Oil. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we had one question on, my fleet is composed of different brands, not only CAT machines, can I still sign up for a CVA service? Now, within our Mantrack organization, we are looking at beyond the yellow iron, so we most certainly do now offer different service contracts for non-CAT equipment. Uh, particularly those of Cummins and Komatsu, Hitachi. Uh, contact your local de your local dealer. They'll be able to tell you exactly which services they provide and what what, what they can offer. I can say that just of recent, we've actually become uh, a Deutsch distributor uh, within our network, so we're able to offer engine servicing for that product. Uh, quite a significant product, I'm sure. Uh, a number of you guys out there have that product as well. So we're able to offer service packages associated with beyond CAT. So if you can get your CAT service bias, you can also get your non-CAT uh, also. So feel free to reach out to your local uh, dealership. They'll be able to give you a lot more information. All right, let's continue on. Um, actually, I saw... Oh, 
All right, yeah, one for John actually. So John, you mentioned um, air, air filter change out intervals um, and, and being more so associated with uh, how much it's actually been utilized rather than just specifically following the OMM. Um, we've got a customer that currently just follows the OMM. What would be your kind of step guidance of how to change out at the right time? Yeah, so so for air filters, if you look in the OMM, most of the air filters are listed as when required. So they're not actually put at a specific hour interval. And the reason we do that is air filters are so application and environmentally specific. You could have one guy who's getting, you know, a thousand hours out of his air filter before it meets restriction, and another guy who's only getting a hundred hours based on where he's working. So uh, we don't have a specific hours. What we recommend you do is use the restriction indicator, whether it's the manual one on the housing or it's in the cab, uh, in the electronics in the cab. Use the restriction indicator to let you know about the length of time that uh, you're going to be able to get operating hours uh, out of that filter before it needs to be changed. And then if you want to set it to the closest interval, you can do that. Uh, but most Caterpillar equipment, there is no specific hour recommendation for air filters. You really have to use that restriction indicator to tell you about where it is uh, I can get my hours uh, up for and, and get the life out of the product. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, John. Uh, actually, John, we've got another one for you. Um, uh, the issue of pre-filling filters has attracted too much debate within my team. Um, is there any way of knowing truly how much damage it could cost it, it could cause by uh, continuing to pre-fill? Um, so that that is a, a hot topic. Um, I, I think for some of the systems, it's not as critical. If you're talking about your engine oil and your transmission oil, um, it, it's not quite as critical for those systems as it is for hydraulic and fuel. Um, what, what I will say is in your fuel system, if you are pre-filling fuel filters, um, you are causing damage to your, uh, your uh, turb, uh, to your uh, high-pressure fuel pumps and your uh, injectors. Uh, it, it's that simple. The level of debris that gets to those components and causes damage is incredibly small. Um, so we absolutely don't pre-fill fuel filters. Um, some of the other systems, you may be able to get away with it and not do a lot of damage. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, hydraulics and fuel, I guarantee you, you're probably causing some damage on your fuel system if you're pre-filling filters, especially if you're filling into the center tube, right? If you're filling into the center tube, that's your outlet port for clean fuel, uh, cause damage. Yeah, and I think particularly uh, when it comes to that outward port, um, yep. you, you certainly don't want to be filling in from that entry. Yep. Um, all right, thank you very much for that, John. Uh, Xavier, if you're still on the line, we have one on oil analysis. Xavier, are you still on the line? You're having such a good chat, you, um, you may have gone for a cup of coffee. Hello, John. Uh, hello, Tristan. Yeah, you're still there. Oh, great. So yes, yeah. I am. We, we, we have a question for you. So uh, okay. with your lab services available now, will you be able to advise us on when to change oil based on lab, uh, lab analysis, or is it still following the same schedule as the OMM? The lab actually tells you exactly when to change the oil, and it can even help you to extend it. If you extend it, it, it means you are we are cutting down costs on the equipment expenses. So actually, yes, the lab can recommend. And it's specific due to the circumstance from the result that we have seen from the analysis. Yeah, and I think particularly important uh, for those that are looking to extend their fluids, particularly in applications like um, hydraulic fluid, with the hydro advanced measures, you can actually increase uh, three times the length of your fluid change out intervals, so long as you're performing that SOS. So you can save uh, rather significant amounts of, of dollars um, by going towards that, particularly for those that may have uh, excavators within their fleet. Um, let's see what else we've got here as well.
Okay, let me just quickly have a, another look through. Let's see. All right. Uh, John, actually, one for you. Um, so typically I use non-genuine filtration products. Um, you know, what would be the biggest thing that you would say the difference is between a genuine and a non-genuine filter? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say the, the biggest difference is going to be um, in, in the performance of that product on the equipment. When you look at the way that Caterpillar filters are manufactured, uh, we have most of our stuff is manufactured in, in a unique facility that's automated, so you get a very consistent product off the line uh, uh, every single day of the week that we manufacture. What we see when we test competitive is there's a large variation in the performance. They might perform really well one time, uh, and then the next time we test them, they don't perform very well at all, right? It, it's a, that ability to make a consistent product day after day uh, is what you have to do in the filtration business. And when you have uh, humans manufacturing things, uh, you have variation, right? There, there's going to be uh, differences in how that thing's put together and, and whether, you know, people were attentive uh, during their task. That's why most of the Caterpillar filters come from a completely – automated facility uh, where we don't have that human interaction. So I think that's probably one of the biggest things. It's it's the manufacturing and how they're put together and the consistency behind the Caterpillar product. Beautiful. Very good answer. Uh, John, we have a very simple one here, I think. Um, yeah, you've mentioned not to adv or advise not to clean out air filters. Um, but what do you do if you don't have any new air filters available at the moment? Um, should you just shut down the machine or should you just clean them to get them up and running? Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, uh, productions is, is king, right? I mean, at the yeah, end of the day, yeah. if, if you're not running, you're not making money. Uh, yeah. What I would say is um, if, you ha if you absolutely have to clean air filters, uh, just be very careful how you do it. Uh, air filters look robust, uh, but they're actually pretty delicate. Every time you handle an air filter, you're – basically introducing some damage to that media. So be very careful how you handle them, pull them off uh, very carefully. Don't bang them out on the side of the machine, uh, tap them off on a, on a step or something like that. If you're going to use pressurized air, make sure you put a reducer on there, uh, you know, down to under 30 PSI for that uh, air pressure, and, and clean it uh, very carefully. You never clean air pressure directly perpendicular to the media. You always wash it down the media at an angle. So if you have to clean them, just be careful how you handle them is what I will tell you. Yeah, great advice, great advice. Um, we have one question here on how to get the SOS software and the installation process. So like we mentioned earlier with uh, Saver and, and myself, so the utilization is through my.cat.com and that will give you everything from being able to view Vision Link, access to PCC, so that's parts.cat.com, as well as looking at all your SOS analysis. So what we would suggest is contact your local dealer and they'll be able to install and get you set up. Um, the installation is a cloud-based software, so you don't need to download anything. Uh, you'll just need a login and password. We'll set that up for you, and then you can go off. All we'll have to do is put your machines into or your assets uh, into there. Now, we can put non-CAT in there as well, so it's not just about the CAT stuff, uh, and we'll be able to give you insights as soon as, as, soon as, as soon as possible. Now, we did have another question on... The CVAs. So I have a CVA. So I have my own service technicians. What can a CVA actually offer me then? So the thing with CVAs is that there's a lot more flexibility. For those that have servicing capability already, that's more than fine. We can tailor a package that includes uh, the parts you need at the right time. So we'll keep the parts uh, on the shelf for you guys when you need it, and we'll ship them off to you uh, as you need. So we can do that. Uh, and have that payment structure as monthly, by the hour, or an agreed con contract up front. So we're able to provide the insights from equipment management, things like uh, vision link telematics systems, which can give you alerts about both your productivity, 
uh, man hours as well as see those all important fault codes that may be going on. So we give you that. We also give you a free inspection of your equipment. So we'll come on out, perform it via cat inspect and you'll get a lovely PDF at the end of the day. And then also really when it comes to cost mitigation is not having to buy bulk parts and put them on your shelves. We keep them in our own storage and when you need them, we'll ship them on uh, and invoice as required. All right, let's continue on. All right, uh, John, we did have a question about uh, reusing oil filters. Uh, but I feel like I know your answer isn't going to be to do that. <laughs> yeah. no, no, that's not recommended. <laughs> no, no. So air filtration, maybe we can get away with that for a little bit, um, but we most certainly don't suggest that. So when sometimes you may not have those parts on the shelf, uh, my recommendation is to please contact your local dealership and we can arrange something where we have those stock parts on the shelf. Particularly when it comes to our fast moving uh, filters and fluids packages, we typically have them uh, with one click, you can get them delivered to your door, you know, within 48 hours. So look to go on parts.cat.com, contact your local dealer. We have a wide range of options. Uh, Mantrack does have a different way of communicating as well. If you want to utilize, you can contact us on Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, all of that sort of stuff. So if you don't have the parts on the shelf, a simple WhatsApp, we'll get back to you within a day and say, here's what we've got, when can we get it to you? So most certainly don't look to reuse. Please uh, get in touch with your dealer to make sure that your system's running to the optimum fashion. Okay, now we have had a lot of um, requests to have the presentation. So what we'll do is we'll actually send through a copy of the presentation uh, via email just in a couple of days. We'll also be putting it up on our YouTube channel and you'll also be able to uh, find it um, within that email that we send. So it takes a couple of days for us just to get all of this uh, put onto uh, YouTube and every other place, but you will be able to, to get access to this. Of course, if you want to go into even more detail and talk specifically about your business and how we can adapt some of these, it's just a simple phone call to get your local representative out. We're always happy to help. We have a plethora of team uh, in the back end that's willing to deep dive into your equipment needs and kind of map out a structure for you guys. So if you want to get even more into your own business, we're always happy to help. You just give us a call and we'll be able to facilitate that. Okay. And then, yeah, the workbook Savior reference. So that's uh, my.cat.com. So if you really want to get that access, my.cat.com. Just put it into Google. It will come on up uh, and we'll be good to go. And finally, someone said, good good session. I mean, it's not a, it's not a question, but it's, um, yeah, it's very appreciated. Thank you very much uh, mm -hmm. for making mention. And look, we're coming to a close now, so I just want to let everyone know at the very end of this, we will have that survey. It'll have a little Mantrack logo right next to the WebEx survey. So if you could please complete the Mantrack survey, it will really do a lot to help us know which direction to go next. I know we've talked uh, fluids, we've talked parts, we've talked CAT SOS, and there's still so much more that we can talk about when it comes to maintenance. Uh, we can even split out and go into power systems, quarrying, mining, whatever you like. Uh, for our regular Caterpillar customers, if, you, if there's something that you would like to specifically talk about, we're able to go ahead and get CAT experts from across the, across the globe to come speak to you guys via WebEx. This is the new technology, this is the new world, and we're happy to facilitate that. So thank you to everyone that spent the time, took the time out of their day. Uh, we most certainly appreciate it. For all our experts, thank you so much uh, for spending some time with us today and informing and providing insight uh, into all things that's scientific when it comes to cat fluids and filters. So everyone, stay safe. Thank you very much. I'm Tristan Kuzlin, and I'll catch you thank later. You. Bye now.